Welcome, welcome, yes, welcome. That is officially the first time I've been called statuesque, but with this figure, oh my gosh. Um, you know what I'm dressed as, right? It's a good guess, but it's a sexy heart. Yeah, oh yeah, sexy conversation heart. Uh, how many of you are very pro-Valentine's? We have a lot of Valentine's fans here. Oh, that's a weak showing for Valentine's. Are there more people who are Valentine's haters? You can be loud about that, it's okay. That's fine. I, um, you know, I've kind of settled into a bit of what I, a, a Valentine's routine. So I like to wake up mm, Valentine's morning and make sure that every florist in New York doesn't have my wife's favorite flower. And then after that, I like to call restaurants and make sure I can get a seating. And yes, I would like to sit at 9.45 tonight. Mm, thank you. And then my part of my routine is I join the running of the husbands to Jacques Torres. I'm not kidding you. At 5.08 on Friday, you mark my words, there's gonna be a bunch of dudes in khakis and blue shirts. Because there's nothing that says I afterthought of you like $10 of chocolate in a $30 box. But you know, I'm actually, it's, it's, I'm actually pretty good at you know, the Valentine's routine. I mean, you just heard the whole routine, it's pretty good, right? My wife though, I mean, she tries, but she's like, you know, she, so one year, this is a true story. My wife gave me a marker for Valentine's Day. It was a Sharpie. And I said, well, what is this? She said, well, well, well it's, um, it's a Sharpie and it's got a fine point tip because you're fine. <laughs> and I was like, did you just give me a dad joke for Valentine's Day? Like a fine point pen for my fine man? And I was like, please leave that to the professionals. I'm the one with the conversation heart on my body right now. Please leave the dad jokes to me. And there will be many more of them to come. And also throughout the night, we'll be meeting a lot of um, actual couples, both beer making and music making, who will be sharing their music and their stories with you tonight. So a lot of you have never been to a beer jam before. How many of you are first timers here? <laughs> Welcome, amazing. So the way this works is that my friends and colleagues from the radio station are gonna be passing out a beer. And so as we, uh, throughout the night, you've already been drinking one from Six Point, and you'll be able to drink um, a beer at every performance. And so that's how it works. We pair craft beer and classical music because I always say that you can fall in love with anything when there's beer involved. <laughs> so if everybody is, how many people, most people at this point have their first beer? Yes? All right. Well, I'd like to introduce you to the two people who make it. Please welcome our friends from Wild East. <laughs> Patricia and Brett, come on out here. Welcome, welcome. All right. Okay, let's make a little room for Brett and Patricia. All right, Brett and Patricia, welcome. Wild East Brewing, tell us, what is this lemonade that you've given us? <laughs> <laughs> so this, um, this is a, our, our interpretation of a Berliner Weiss. Um, we make it very traditionally. Um, and it's, uh, it's fermented with uh, yeast and bacteria and in, uh, in an, a large oak vat. Um, and we, uh, you know, we're very proud of it. It's one of our, one of our flagship beers, but uh, we decided to fruit it with raspberries um, and it's this nice pink color because it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> so here we are. Oh, well, cheers. Cheers. Cheers, cheers. Yeah. Mm. cheers. Very good. All right, so it's a fruited Berliner Weisse. Exactly. Tell me a little bit about the name of your brewery, Wild East. Right. Um, we brew with a lot of wild yeast. Um, so this is oh a... Oh my God, this is like the, is this yeah. the first non-Matt dad joke of the night? It's very pun-tastic. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, it's, it's a play on words, obviously, and, and it's also uh, incorporates a lot of um, sort of, I used to be a cartographer, um, and so a little bit of directionality, um, and uh, a little bit of a, you know, our guy riding the line is sort of a, a, a taming the line is sort of like, there's a lot of lines in German and Belgian uh, historical iconography. So we're sort of like, you know, our, our, we're sort of, it's taking us into the future um, on its back, essentially. Okay, so you're riding a line into the future. Um, 
Patricia, were you okay with that logo? <laughs> <laughs> um, I will neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> no, I, I think it does pay great homage to this kind of older European tradition, but also giving a bit of an American middle finger to it, too, which I like. I like the blasphemous part. Yeah. The reverential part. Very cool. Um, and so tell me, um, when did you start the brewery Wild East? In my heart, I started about <laughs> about eight years ago. In actuality, we um, it's it's been a business plan probably for the last five years, and then um, we we've had our space in Gowanus um, on Sackett Street um, for we, well, we started at least in October th 2018, and we're we're just making beer starting this past December. Um, construction in New York City, guys, and um, <laughs> and uh, we are hoping to have the tap room open in the next you know month or so. So tell me a little bit about how you two met. Yeah. <laughs> it was beer that brought us together. Um, apparently this one saw my profile on Match and I made a reference to West Coast IPs, which were trending at the time. Um, and uh, I guess it was beer at first sight. <laughs> yeah, uh, and she, she made a reference to, um, to uh, she made some literary references, which I, I later found that she's a novelist, so that's great. Um, so two of my favorite things were kind of came together, and, and that's sort of it took us into the future. And so, how do you enjoy working together? Oh, that's, oh I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to step on the Oz. Uh, and how do you enjoy working together? Um, you would think, what do a beer, you know, a brewer and a novelist? Where's kind of that Venn diagram of overlap? Um, but what's interesting is because Brett specializes in a lot of barrel-aged sour beers, and there's this long incubation process, not unlike writing a novel, where you're just sitting there waiting for the inspiration to hit. Maybe it does. More often than not, you're just kind of hanging out in the fridge waiting for the inspiration there. Um, but yeah, we, we talk about these long processes and, um, and uh, the joy that we get from eventually our, our product making it out there. Well, Brett Taylor and Patricia Park, thank you so much for sharing this Berliner Weisser from thank Wild you. East in Gowanus. Yes. Please stop by when construction's ready, right? Yep. All right. Thank Give it up for them. Brett Taylor and Patricia Park, Wild East Brewing. Thank you so thank much. You. So while we're drinking um, this lovely Berliner Weisser, um, we have some music to share. And the first piece tonight will, be, will come from George Gershwin, who wrote like some of the most romantic songs in the history of songs, right? Embraceable You and I Loves You Porgy and so many others. Um, but George Gershwin did not marry, uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, he is in a long-term relationship with Kay Swift. Um, and people said that he would never marry Kay because um, he liked to party he was uncomfortable with children, and, um, <laughs> and he was too self-centered. In other words, a man. <laughs> and I will say that's mostly true, though. As I've gotten older, you know, I don't like to party as much, but I'm still very uncomfortable with children. <laughs> so here to play George Gershwin's The Man I Love, please welcome Greg Taylor and Dasha Koltenyuk.
Dasha and Greg. Dasha Kolkenyuk and Greg Kaler. Amazing. That was wonderful. Love it, Gershwin. So um, tell me a little bit about um, how you two met. Uh, well, we happened to sit next to each other on stage. I work at Princeton University Concerts, and I was working backstage, and I run up to the stage, and there's just one seat left, and it happens to be next to this one. <laughs> now, were you awake at the time? Were you? I was, although I'm not sure what it says about me that there was only one seat left. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm glad it worked out quite well. Our, our connection was instant and uh, very deep. And I know that one of the projects you're working on involves the Escher Quartet. Can you say a little bit about that, Greg? Uh, yeah, actually it was the, the Escher Quartet that brought us together. They were performing that night at Princeton. Um, and I wrote a piece for String Octet that the Escher and Dover Quartets just premiered in Ohio, and they're gonna do it again this summer in Aspen. Congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome, playing an octet in Aspen. Um, and Dasha, one of the things that you do in Princeton, which I find intriguing, is that you organized um, not just classical concerts, but also a classical meditation series. Can you say a little bit about what that is? Oh, that's really a, another tie-in there. Um, our next live music meditation will feature the Dover Quartet. Uh, it's just a series that we started several years ago where artists who come to play on the evening concert also come in the afternoon and play live music as people meditate. Um, just for about 20 minutes and it enables very focused, deep listening and a kind of listening that I actually start missing at regular concerts. That's a great, great thing. Um, so I want to ask about your wedding night. <laughs> Not that part. Get your mind out of the gutter. No, your actual wedding, the wedding night. You played a piece of music. Um, Greg, because not only you're a pianist, you're also a composer. Tell me a little bit about this work. Tasha and I obviously are both pianists, and we thought, uh, well, our, our wedding had a lot of music. We asked our, some of our closest friends to serenade us with musical toasts, and we wanted to be part of the action. And we thought, what could be more right than for the two of us to begin our marriage with the piece that we played together? So uh, it was literally our first dance as a married couple, and it's called First Dance. All right, so we're going to recreate some of that wedding night magic right here. <laughs> We're on Facebook Live, just keep it clean. <laughs> and please enjoy First Dance.
Greg Kaler, Dasha Colton Yuk. They make beautiful music together, and it all started with that first dance on their wedding night. Thank you so much. Thank you. And check out the Princeton series that uh, Dasha is in charge of. And Greg is. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna work Greg a lot through the night. He's a beer jam a veteran, which means he's got um, a liver of steel and and <laughs> fingers of gold. And so he'll be back from later on in the show. Thank you both so much. So um, we're going to be turning our attention to an, a new beer in just a couple of minutes. But before we do, it's time for some classical beer jam trivia. Yeah. Um, so I, I, so I want to, um, I'm going to need a volunteer from the audience for this. So you, you've had your eye on this trivia for a while. Come on up here. Come on up here. Welcome, welcome. You need a hand? You're good. Tell me your name. Deborah. Deborah, where are you from? Washington Heights. All right, thanks for making it down here. Oh, Washington Heights also elsewhere in our house, I'm told. Um, so, Deborah, um, we are doing the um, that's not the game. <laughs> wow. Okay, we, that was, and it's over. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna so we're gonna do a game called Great Milestones in Classical Romance, because there are many historians believe that there was no more romantic gesture than in 1856 when Robert Schumann surprised his wife by dying alone of syphilis. But <laughs> there have been others, and so I'm gonna test your knowledge on some of the great milestones in classical romance. You ready for me? Okay, here we go. Question number one. The ever-lovable Richard Wagner gave the world many things, including the famous original epic opera, but what did he once give his wife for her birthday? Was it A, bodega roses and a pint of Ben and Jerry's? <laughs> B, an autographed manuscript of her, his musical idol, Giacomo Meyerbeer? C, a new composition played by a string ensemble to wake her up on the big day? Or D, a gushing letter about how great she is, how grateful he feels, blah, 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 which he posted to Facebook and then called it a day. <laughs> What's your answer? I'm going to go with C. That's correct. He woke her up on her birthday <laughs> with a live band to play a new work he had done called Siegfried Idol. He, um, parenthetically, also learned that morning better to get her coffee first before showing up with live musicians. <laughs> Moving on to question two. You're one for one. When brilliant symphonist and feminist icon Gustav Mahler married the talented musician Alma Schindler, he gave her an ultimatum. He said, the only person to have a musical career in this house will be me. Now, who advised him to rethink that arrangement? Was it A, Theodore Roosevelt, B, Sigmund Freud, C, Gertrude Stein, or D, Oprah? I'm going to go with B. That's correct. B is Sigmund Freud. Now, the two men knew each other and spent a little time together in, um, in Vienna. They were kind of uh, contemporaries, and Freud asked him about his mother and then his Mahler. <laughs> You're doing great so far. Now, Charles Gounod, the French composer, had many affairs and a big beard, but none more scandalous, <laughs> the affairs, that being, the, none more scandalous than with the Englishwoman Georgina Weldon. Now, he lived in the attic of her and her husband's home in London for a while. And Georgina, each day, would go upstairs to inspire him to compose. I'm speaking in code right now. Okay. So, when Gounod decided to patch things up with his wife and move back to Paris, what did Georgina Weldon do? Did she, A, throw all his belongings from the attic window to the street below? B, throw herself into the Thames? C, wrote her name in blue crayon on every page of his new opera manuscript, or D, leaked all of their love letters to Julian Assange. I'm gonna go with, because this is what I would do, throw all the stuff out onto the street. A. You, a, you didn't come alone, right? So I'm just warning you now, <laughs> this, is, this is the plan. But no, she wrote her name in blue crayon on every page of his new opera script, um, just to let the world know who owned him. <laughs> Moving on. The composer Benjamin Britten and his partner, and partner Peter Piers lived in Brooklyn for a time, sharing a room at the famous February House, an artist's home in Brooklyn Heights. 
Why did they decide to leave? A, they broke up because peers refused to join the food co-op and everyone in the house has to be a member. Come on. <laughs> Was it B, after their roommate Gypsy Rose Lee finished all of their booze, Pierce said he needed a bigger place without roommates and with laundry in the goddamn building. <laughs> Was it C, Britain felt homesick and wanted to write an opera about a fisherman, or D, they both wanted to enlist and fight for Britain in the Great War? <laughs> C, the fisherman one. That's actually right. He wanted to go write Peter Grimes, and so Pierce agreed to go with him all the way back to England. And they stayed together for more than 30 years. Okay, you are doing outstandingly well. And so one of the things about the Beer Jam uh, and Beer Jam trivia is that somewhere on this stage, we've hidden a prize. And I'm going to send you around to look for it pretty soon. <laughs> it's right behind here. Yeah. And so right now, you're three for four. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's, would you just hold one handle for me? Sure. Okay. So, Deborah, what's in this bag is we've got... Um, a WQXR beer cozy. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a WQXR fidget spinner. <laughs> All right, for those restless hands. Actually, we have two cozies, so you can share them with a friend. We have a set of stickers. Some of our favorite composers. Oh, I heard a gasp on stickers. <laughs> Memo to, <laughs> to the marketing department. And finally, this is wrapped in plastic, so you know it's not been used. One of our Leonard beer steins. Yeah. So now you're three for four. And the way this works is that if you answer any number of questions, you win the prize. <laughs> so your record right now is right on track because you've answered questions. So the final one is about Robert and Clara Schumann, who were both very dedicated to each other. They overcame a legal challenge to their marriage by his, her father. They raised eight children together and wrote lots and lots of music. And during the early years of their marriage, Robert and Clara shared what charming ritual? There they are. Look at them. Oh, so cute. So cute. Um, <laughs> was it A, using the same toothbrush? <laughs> was it, <laughs> people were like, no, that couldn't be. <laughs> it was the 1800s, people. Lots of stuff went down. <laughs> Lots of germs. It's fine. It's like, okay, did they, B, give up booze for January? C, <laughs> You already know the answer to that. C, write in the same diary together, or D, wear matching clothing. <laughs> I'm gonna go with the diary one. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Robert and Clara Schumann shared a diary together in the early years of their marriage. They were so ecstatic to be living together, finally, after a legal challenge that they said they were just gonna tell their story together. Well, thank you for being with us on these great milestones in classical romance. And congratulations on being our first winner of tonight. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay, by now, everybody has a beer except me, so I'm feeling awesome. And we need to fix that. So please, from Alewife Brewing, please welcome Keir Hamilton. All right, there's, there's what I'm looking for. Cheers. 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 How are you? It's good to see you again. Uh, yes, on you too. Mm. So tell the people what we've got. Uh, in your glass right now, we have Thousand Stars, which is our uh, Pilsner. Um, it is our like flagship beer, uh, and it's a classic German Pilsner, and it has Saphir hops and Tettnanger hops, all uh, noble hops straight from Germany. So we're trying to keep it as true to the style as possible. I'm glad you don't have any common hops. Tell me about the noble hops uh, that go into these kinds of beers. Um, the What's the difference? Difference is... Is it just the bloodline thing? Oh, uh, yeah, kind of, yeah. It's, <laughs> they're like classic hops from uh, uh, Europe, from like the Czech Republic and uh, Slovenia and Germany. Um, those kind of the, the original hop growing regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're just you know, like a little bit kind of... A little better than the rest of those hops? Well, you know... The, the modern American hops like to go big and juicy and fruity, and then these are the classic ones to make your classic styles. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So how does it get the name? Uh, Thousand Stars is... I actually named this uh, beer for my girlfriend, and it is after uh, an Ed Sheeran song that I can't remember right now. <laughs> There's a line in it that says, oh. Under the Light of a Thousand Stars. Oh. So that's where it came from. So it's Ed Sheeran 
and, and meets a Pilsner. Is, yes. this, is this the only beer named after Ed Sheeran, or there must be thousands by now? Uh, there might be a couple. <laughs> I, I, I try to come up with some very like kind of funny names uh, for our little small batch stuff at the brew pub. Um, I had one, uh, you're going to need a bigger boat from Movie Jaws. Um, they mostly come at night, mostly. What's that from? Anybody? Aliens. Aliens. Oh, it's good. It's a little oh, girl. Yeah. Pop culture shame me. It's okay. Yeah, I, work at a classical, yeah. I work at a classical station. I'm not supposed to know this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Thinking of beer names is like super hard. And when the beer, like when I make such a small batch of it, it's only going to last a week. It's like, should I put that much effort into this? It's going to yeah. be gone. You know, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Um, so um, speaking of unusual names, tell me about Alewife. Because every time I think of it, I think of a herring. Yes, so we didn't know that when we started, and then people also clearly came nobody down Jewish on your uh, on your squad. It's okay. People also yeah. came down from Boston and said, "Why are you named after a train station?" And we we're like, "Oh no, 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 no!" <laughs> Way back in the day when beer first started to be commercially brewed, it was done by women, and they were known as alewives. Yep. Um, so that's why we were called alewife. Yeah. Oh, cheers! And so, where can I find more alewife beer if I like this pilsner? Oh. Or I want to come out at night mostly or uh, <laughs> yes. need a boat. Uh, uh, all over the city. Just g go into any bar, and if we ain't there, ask for us, and then hopefully they'll buy us and get us in their bar. <laughs> Please, you're all my sales team now. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, do you have a tap room too? We are currently uh, building our new facility out in uh, Sunnyside, Queens, uh, 4111 39th Street in Skillman. Um, I, I, I just remembered that. Yeah. yeah. I got um, it. Hopefully, got it. yeah, give us six months. We should be there. You know, it's New York City. Construction takes forever and permits and stuff like that. It seems to be a theme so far among our yes. brewers. <laughs> Brett just say the same thing. Yeah. Brett's a lot closer. We were at their facility last night and they're just waiting for a couple of permits and they'll be good to go. All right. Yes. Cool. Well, Kier, thank you so much for bringing this pill. Thank, thank you for telling your Everyone stories. Everyone enjoy. Enjoy. And in Kier's honor, we'll be playing, our next selection will be by Ed Sheeran. So, um, you know, one of the things about classical music is that when you look around the world, right, you, of classical music, you kind of start to see a lot of dudes with beards and mustaches, and they kind of have a certain sameness to them, right? It's kind of like we're working in the Smithsonian Museum of American Privilege. And so obviously there are other stories to tell and classical music is much broader and richer than we sometimes remember. And this next group is dedicated to championing underrepresented artists and composers um, who were queer in classical music and sharing their perspectives and their stories. And you know, um, take for instance Tchaikovsky. Now Tchaikovsky had a preference for men at a time when that was really not accepted and it tortured him his whole entire life. And he tried to fit in. He actually married someone, and it was a total disaster. I mean, miserable. He had a nervous breakdown. And there's not a lot of funny in that, except <laughs> I found a letter that he wrote to his sister after spending a long weekend with his in-laws. I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> he said, after three days with them in the country, I begin to see that everything I can't stand in my wife derives from her belonging to a completely weird family. <laughs> so even though this drove him to a nervous breakdown, it otherwise is basically an utterly unremarkable marriage. <laughs> so to play, to play the music of Tchaikovsky, please welcome Chamber Queer.
Chamber Queer, amazing. Danielle, that's so good. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, so we started with Tchaikovsky, we ended in Cole Porter. I need to know a little bit more. Danielle. <laughs> Danielle Buonaiuto, by the way. Thank vocals. you, thank you very much. You. Jason Worth, Andrew Yee, Julia Biber. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we were asked to put together a little set for you all uh, around a Valentine's Day theme. We were like, okay, Valentine's Day, queer Valentine's Day, happy, sad, like we have so many ways to go with this. But we started with what we usually do, which is, okay, what queer composers can we kind of mine for some ideas here? So Tchaikovsky came to mind in this sort of sentimental waltz. So it was originally a piano piece, I think, right? Um, and that's an E minor, and we found our way to 
B flat minor via the wizardry of Jason Wirth because I wanted to pair Poulenc and Cole Porter who were sort of contemporaries both sort of like around Paris but working in really different idioms actually not that different but definitely different spheres um, with two songs that had kind of the same vibe. The first is this earnest sort of like, oh, I don't want anything in the world except to love you. And the second is the same, but a little more tongue in cheek. So kind of two sides of the same coin. Fantastic. So tell me, I mean, you three are among the original members of this group. So yeah. tell me a little bit more about how you came together and what your goals are as an ensemble. Sure, yeah. Um, I met Jules at a random show yeah. and um, <laughs> And yeah, like like this kind of thing, and uh, and I'll have you know yeah. this is no random yeah, this show. This is no random. <laughs> Please, this is a very carefully curated art making experience. <laughs> My word. And good night, Chamber Queer. You're off. <laughs> this is how you get invited back. Yeah. Um. But Jules and I were talking about how great it would be if there were an organization that did something like this. And, uh, and I knew uh, Danielle um, from uh, an opera she was singing and she sang the pants off of it. And um, I knew she was thinking about similar things. And uh, she had a friend, Brian, who uh, they, were, they were already talking about something similar. So we, we joined forces and so yeah, we have two cellists and two singers, which already is pretty revol re re revolutionary yeah. in, the, in the music. So much movie. music written for that yeah. configuration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I also wanted to ask that um, since just about everybody on stage so far has been in a relationship, Jules and Danielle, you are also together, is that right? Yes. Why so, yes. why yes. Um, so how did you meet? Was it was I need to know was either beer or Ed Sheeran involved? <laughs> I think beer was We should was just involved. have a kind of a running tally on the board. Like you a whiteboard of, yeah, <laughs> you know. Definitely beer. Definitely beer. <laughs> yeah. And dogs. And dogs. We both love dogs a lot. But Chamber Queer. But Chamber Queer was, was how we first met. Um, actually, yeah, Andrew introduced us. So. I certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Yeah, no, basically I just implicated myself in Jules' life because Jules has a very adorable dog and it's a great pretext, you know? It's like, oh, well, I, I mean, I could come on a walk with the dog. I mean, that would be great. You know, I just walk with the dog like for a really long days? time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is what they're calling it. Walking with the dogs. And then it would be like, let's go get a beer. And then it would be like, we should do chamber queer work. And then it would be like, you know, maybe we should get together again. And yeah, The rest is history. That is very sweet. Well, um, I want to make sure to mention that you, on Wednesday, have a collaborative composition experience at Hunter College as Chamber Queer, is that March right? March 18th. March 18th. Yeah. And also the Pauline Oliveros Drawing Party. Can you say more about that? That's on April 26th. Yeah, it's the day after my birthday, and they're like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to do experiential sort of like group listening and drawing events, uh, because that's just who, what I like. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, so like we're going to get, get together and people are going to like sing and we're going to all like be like cool with each other and, uh, and, uh, and then people are going to draw. We're going to team up with a, with an organization called Sketchy Queers. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, <laughs> and we're that's gonna, what they yeah. do. Yeah. It's really, it's going to be really, really fun. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have a bunch to drink too. So it's going to be great. Yeah. Can anybody just get tickets for that? Yeah, it's free. Oh, yeah, anyone Even who wants better. to come. Yeah, check our website, chamberqueer.org, and uh, all of our community events are free. Um, and sign up for our mailing list, yeah. Awesome. Can I ask you for one more piece of music? Oh, my gosh. Gladly. Oh, yes, thank you. Don't do you make got? me sing. <laughs> I'm going to sing again. Oh, I know, you hate it. But <laughs> yeah, we're going to get Jason some music. I'm going to do one of my party pieces. Y'all know Musetta from La Boheme? Musetta, she's like barges in an act two into the cafe and she's like, excuse me, where's Marcello? <laughs> there he is, I hate him. Look how hot I am. <laughs> I'm gonna make him so jealous because I love him. <laughs> and I think I can, we, I certainly can relate. We can all relate, you know? So anyway, a little bonbon for you on Valentine's Day. Mwah, I love you all.
Chamber Queer, Danielle Buonaiuto, amazing, Jason Wirth, Andrew Yee, Jules Biber. What a pleasure, thank you. Wowie, right? So many great things ahead of us. And I hope you'll go to some of their events and sign up for their newsletter. What an amazing array of talent there. Holy smokes, right? Right? All right, so you're about three beers in. How's it going for you folks so far? All right, see, now I got some more people interested in Valentine's Day. You know, every year at the radio station, we, um, we do a, um, how do you say, a, a countdown of the most romantic pieces in classical music. You might hear about that. So we ask people to vote on it, and every year um, we count down the winners on Valentine's night, right? So this coming Friday, uh, you can turn on the radio and you can hear the most romantic pieces of classical music according to our listeners. One of the funny things about this annual tradition at the station is that we get a lot of people voting for Ravel's Bolero. And like they'll leave a little comment when they do and they say, it just reminds me of S-E-X. <laughs> like they won't even, like as if like, like they don't want to say it out loud. It's like G-D, S-E-X. They'll put a dash between everything, which is hilarious to me because if you know the piece, there's a certain element of like, really? Like, yet da da ya ya da ya da ya Really? That's, that's, like for 15 minutes? Are we kidding ourselves? Come on. All right, so it is time for a new game here at the Classical Beer Jam. So I do need, I have another volunteer. I saw somebody earlier who would like to join us. Uh, would you like to join us, my friend? Please come on up. Yes, you. And also please welcome to help us out Mr. Greg Kaler on the piano. Greg, welcome. Don't just walk by and not say hi. Hi. My goodness. All right, so my volunteer is coming up. So wonderful. Welcome. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm Julia. 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 Where are you from, Julia? Jersey City. Oh, yeah, that's okay. I like Jersey. <laughs> I grew up in New Jersey. It's oh. true. Even my, even my mother's here right now. I'm not going to point her out yet. You'll just have to guess. We'll get her on stage later tonight. So, Julia, this next game um, is a feast of the ears and the eyes. Because we've been talking a lot about couples, but you know what's harder than being in a couple? Being out there and dating. How many people are dating right now? Julie, are you dating right now? I'm married. Oh, so you're, you're off the market. Sorry, everybody. Not available. Who, who's, anybody here dating right now? Nobody dating? My God. Oh, I got one hand in the back. Jeez. Is it hard? So hard, right? I mean, I thought this was one of those things that the internet was going to make super easy, right? Because I'm a creature of, you know, the 1900s when I met, to, met my wife through friends. How did you meet your partner? Uh, graduate school. Okay, so another real life experience. But for a lot of great composers in history, they had to put profiles online on the website match.composers. <laughs> and so today, Julia from Jersey City, you're going to have to identify the composer based on their online profile and a musical clue played by my good friend Je Greg Kaler. Okay. So, are you ready for your first pro uh, composer profile? Yes. Here we go. On the screens, everybody. Here we go. I can now be able to read this. Um, I make music for a living and also for all mankind. Just on here looking for my muse, my ideal first date. The Rhineland's finest. Me playing Bach at the piano. You shouting sweet nothings in my ear. People say I'm the ultimate romantic. My motto, true love is immortal. Can we get a musical clue behind this? Uh... Beethoven. Beethoven. Very good, with two notes, she guessed it, Greg. Amazing. There he is, Ludwig, age 30, pianist composer at Self-Employed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's self-employed. Okay, you're ready. For, you're doing very good. You're one for one so far. And remember that if you answer anything right or wrong, you win the tote bag with the Leonard Bernstein. Be I know it's you're already winning just by being here, Julia. When you bought your ticket, you were you had already won. Okay, our next profile. Age 28, composer at Teatro Alla Scala. Uh, kind of a hopeless romantic. I'm a 
mighty hunter of wild fowl, operatic librettos, and attractive women. Not looking for anything serious now. Been described as Verismo, King Hot. Most of my favorite women die in Act 3, but let's see if we can go the distance. <laughs> Musical clue, Greg. Uh, Puccini. Very good, Julia! <laughs> Nicely done, Greg. All right, there he is, Giacomo, age 28. That was, um... Uh, no, I think that, I believe that was La Boheme. Was it? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I'm not so good at classroom. Everybody, it's, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. There's no shame in classical music. Everybody's right. Everybody's a winner. <laughs> Ready for your next one? Yes. See? We're good, right? Yeah. We're going to come back from that butterfly thing, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, all right. He's 29. Our next bachelor, he's a vice Kapellmeister at the court of Prince Esterhazy, 4,000 miles away or so. He's the father of 104 symphonies that I know of. In an open marriage, the only woman I ever loved got sent to a nunnery by her parents. Um, I'm an expert at courting and friends say I'm full of surprises. So basically, I'm more fun than your ex. Greg? Haydn. Very good. Franz Josef Haydn. You're nailing it, Julia. All right, there he is, Franz Josef, age 29. It's true, he was very unhappily married. His wife used to use his manuscript paper for her baking sheets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm, oh, very mean. Okay, we would have had like 106 symphonies. I'm moving on. Okay, I've gotta move over. I seriously, I'm getting so old. Um, <laughs> Age 25, the concertmaster court of Count Colorado. He's 4,100 miles away right now. He's a former child star, pretty, pretty, uh, still pretty famous, to be honest. People hear me play and wig out. A regular Don Giovanni with the ladies, 5'7 in heels. If we don't work out, maybe, maybe you've got a cute sister. Poop emoji, poop emoji, poop emoji. Laughing, 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 100, 100, 100. <laughs> Wolfman, 1756, Greg? Mozart. Yes, there he is. It is true that he did marry his, um, his ex's sister, and he also had a thing for poop. <laughs> and he was very short. Super tiny. <laughs> short man, big talent. Here we go. And our final one, Julia, you are just killing it today. Let me show you the bag, too. Because I just want to, I just want to make sure everybody feels the tension here. So this is the WQXR tote bag. You hear us talking about it during the membership drives when you're going to give next. We've got the stickers. Uh, the gasp! We've got the beer cozy. You all right? Yeah. And we, there's a, oh yeah, the fidget spinner. You can also use this if you're feeling tense right now. Um, oh, I, I dig deeper. I found WQXR pens. And the Leonard Beerstein. Okay. So, one composer profile hangs between you and this tote bag of gifts. <laughs> Age 28, the court organist at the court of Weimar. God, music, long walks, and strong coffee. Grew up in a big family, want to have a bunch of kids of my own. How about 20? Does that sound good to you? Um, come check out my band on Friday nights at Zimmerman's Coffee House. I'll put you down on the list. And I am always DTF, down to fugue. <laughs> Greg? Bach. Yeah, there he is, Johann Sebastian Bach. You can't keep up a guy like that, a bachelor, a long time. I know you would have swiped right. Congratulations, Julia. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right, give it up for Julia and Match.Composers on the Classical Beer Jam. Oh, my God, I am thirsty. Mm, so, so thirsty. Can we please, has everybody got a beer so far? Can you please welcome the brewer uh, team behind that beer, Jamie Foxx of Six Point Brewing. And Michael, oh my God, I got a two for one. <laughs> Cheers. Nice. Yeah. Nice for uh, okay. Oh, so I want to introduce you to some old friends of the Beer Jam. Not, you're not old, but I meant you've been here Pretty for a while. Well, yeah, now that we're being honest. <laughs> so... Jamie and Mike Fox, you are a married couple. We are. Yeah, yeah. You're both in the beer business. We are. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I'm sure that beer is the secret to a long and happy marriage. It definitely is. <laughs> so um, first of all, tell us about the beer that we have in our hands. So this beer is Sweet Action. I'm sure a few of you have had this oh, before. Oh, right. I got a lot of hard cheers for Sweet Action. New York City Classic. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay, good. Um, so yeah, so I figured Valentine's Day Sweet Action made a lot of sense. It's the first beer we ever brewed. So here we are. So this is the first beer that uh, that Red uh, that Six Point ever did? Yep. And so that was back in like the early aughts, right? 2004. Okay. And so you may recognize Six Point because they come mostly in cans. Mm -hmm. And I want to share something with you all. That's a secret that Mike and Jamie told me last time we got together, mm. which is that when you have a cold can and you want to take it out of the fridge, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's going to skunk. Everybody know this one? Yeah. No? Okay, so there's a superstition that if you have cold beer and you let it get warmed up again, that it'll go bad. And Mike and Jamie says... No. That's not true. No, not true. Can you explain why? Well, most beer gets skunked because it's uh, exposed to light. So if you have a... A bottle of beer and it's sitting around for a little while it will get skunked but canned beer is protected from that because of the aluminum so now we know this so just it's, take it in put it out right. take it in put it out it's all good if it's in a can it's probably not ideal you don't want it to get warm <laughs> but if it's like cold and you leave it out for a little bit and you put it back in you won't know the difference awesome and so jamie you know a lot about this because you are a cicerone i am a cicerone so can you it's not a cicerone it's not i had i had one of those <laughs> it's definitely not that um say what it is so it's kind of like the beer equivalent of a sommelier. Mm. I'm a snob. Okay, so can you give us the snobbiest ex explanation of what we're drinking right it's, now? It's funny because I actually can't because Sweet Action is like a really easy beer. It's not very uh, okay. technical. Well, it's 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 not an actual style, I think, is the problem, right? So if, if there was a style of Is this of what beer, they teach you in Cicerone school? <laughs> they're like, make it up. No one knows what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> so the thing with Sweet Action is the reason this is the first beer we ever brewed is because it was made for our owner's friend. And he said, you know, what, what kind of beer do you want? And she goes, I don't know. I like pale owls. I like Belgian beers. I like wheat beers. I like, you know, malty beers. And he was like, okay. So we just made this. So it's not actually any set style. So I can't give you any really deep information about it because it's kind of its own thing. And I think that's why it resonates with so many people because it tastes like nothing else. Nice, nicely. Actually, I, you saved in the end. I like that. <laughs> and so, and tell me about the name. How did you get the name Sweet Action? So, spicy. It's a spicy story. Oh, wait, are, are you, is everybody here over 21? <laughs> I should have asked that at the beginning of the show. Okay, I think we're safe. All okay, right. um, we're growing up here. So, <laughs> Sweet Action uh, was a porn magazine in the late 90s, early 2000s. <laughs> you see how I pretended not to know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's acting. Um, yeah, so it was a porn magazine uh, made by women for women um, where they would only interview men who were more men, I think, and women too, but mostly men, musicians, who would agree to pose naked for their magazine. Um, and these people were a friend of the brewery and uh, we made Sweet Action for their launch party. So it was named after the magazine and it was supposed to be kind of like a like a little one-off beer and then everyone liked it and we wound up canning it and here I am 15 years later talking about it on stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, cheers to that. Cheers. Thank you both. And we're gonna see you a little bit later yeah. and we're gonna learn about Mike's brewery. Yeah. All right, cheers. cheers. Thank you, Thanks, Jamie guys. and Mike Fox. <laughs> Sweet Action. You ready for some more music too? Yeah. All right. So, um, a lot of couples. How many people got married in a courthouse? Woo! All right. You went to the courthouse and, and did it, right? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Congratulations. Uh, Robert Schumann and Clara Schumann took that to a whole nother level because they did have to go to court to get married, but it's because her father was suing them to keep them from being together. And um, the, you want to know why? Clara Wieck, Clara Schumann's na uh, maiden name, Clara Wieck was a star. She was one of the most incredible pianists in the world at that time in Europe. She came to Vienna, they named a cake after her. It was Torte a la Wieck, and the critics said that it just played itself into your mouth, which is kind of <laughs> weird and gross. But like, her dad came to Vienna, and she was like in her teens, and she was playing these concerts, and people were out of their minds, and he could not believe the money. Like, could not believe it. He was like, like waxing his mustache, like, we're in the money! <laughs> and so when she wanted to get married to one of his former students, he was like, no. 
and it was like this whole this kind of menagerie. It was like a pop bear and a fox in the hen house and a cash cow, and it was all this big mess. And he sued them for years in court to keep them from getting married. Now they finally prevailed. She gave up a lot of her performing career until later on um, and supported Robert Schumann to become one of the great romantic composers. She still maintained close relationships with just about every composer in Europe at that time and has left a long mark in the history of classical music. And to play the music of both Clara and Robert Schumann, please welcome Yuna Kim and Stefan Jakif with Greg Kaler.
Una Kim, Stefan Jacquif, Greg Kaler accompanying them. The music of the Schumanns. Wow. So we had a uh, romance and evening song. Um, Una, can you tell me a little bit about what you played and, um, and why you put them together like that? So I began with the Clara Schumann romances, um, and it's actually originally written for the violin and piano. But uh, quite recently, we were celebrating 200th year of Clara Schumann's birth, and I came across this three romances played by Stefan, actually. <laughs> and it was so beautiful, I fell in love with it, so immediately I was like, oh, I gotta play that. So I arranged it for my instrument, <laughs> and that was the first uh, romance of the three, and the Abend lead. Yeah, I played an Abend lead and evening song by Robert Schumann, um, also a transcription, not transcribed by me because I'm not as talented as Yuna, um, <laughs> but transcribed uh, originally for actually for piano four hands, um, and transcribed for the violin by uh, one of their friends, the violinist Joseph Joachim. So, um, sorry, you, you held that one. Um, so, Stefan, I want to mention that you are a WQXR 20 for 20 artist, so yes. this, is, this is an amazing distinction. Um, Thanks, everybody. It's an honor. He was among 20 artists named as an artist to watch for the year 2020. And so what I will say to you on behalf of the station, just you can just give up practicing. We got it from here. You're on autopilot, man. Your career is just... We got you. We got you. All right, but you're also working a lot. So tell me a little bit about the, your work with um, uh, Jeremy Dank and the Junction Trio. Um, these are two projects that are really close to my heart. The first is a duo that I have with the pianist Jeremy Dank. Um, we first played together in 2007, um, and it was kind of love at first note. This was a, at a music festival in Seattle, and the first piece we ever played together was the Richard Strauss Violin Sonata. Um, and since then, we played qu quite a bit together, and kind of our our biggest project has been performing, touring, and also recording the complete sonatas of Charles Ives, mm. um, who I think is probably the greatest American composer. Um, we've got some Ives fans yeah, in the house. Yeah, Ives fans showing um, up tonight. <laughs> you're you're going to be happy. We've got, we've got an Ives treat waiting for you in just a little bit. Um, and the other uh, um, project we mentioned is the Junction Trio, which is a piano trio that I'm with, with um, I'm in with the uh, pianist and composer Conrad Tao and the cellist Jay Campbell. Um, and we play a few concerts each year together. Uh, we each kind of have our own individual things going on. Um, actually, we're playing together this Saturday in Sanibel Island in Florida. Oh, I feel so um, bad we'll be for playing you. playing Shostakovich and Beethoven. Yeah, um, but so sad. They're two of my favorite musicians yeah. ever. Yeah, I know, it's, <laughs> it's a tough life. Um, I love them and I've learned so much from them Really, I feel like they've, they've given me so much, so that's, that's something I really treasure. Okay. So, Yuna, um, I wanted to ask you, um, you said you were listening to Stefan's transcript, uh, playing of the romances, but um, you are all, you are, you've gotten to know him a little bit better since, right? <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that you should know about these two is that they are engaged. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You show it again. Show it again. <laughs> so... Um, can you, would you mind telling us uh, the, about um, the proposal? The proposal? Oh. <laughs> well, we actually got engaged about three years ago. It's been oh, a good. while. <laughs> it's good. We're gonna do it. <laughs> oh my God, this is like the most millennial moment of the night. <laughs> nice long engagement, yeah. I mean, we have a date set for April, so we, we are going to get married uh -huh. in uh -huh. April. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see the uh, invite. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> um, it was about, yeah, was, so three years ago, around April, actually, um, I wake up. It's Saturday, so I wanted to wake up really late. I wanted to sleep in, I mean, um, so it was like 11, maybe, when I woke up. And we have a dog named Ludwig, and he's... <laughs> <laughs> Now he's three, but back then he was like a year old. And Stefan um, was saying, let's go out for a walk. And I said, okay. Oh, this is the dog walking thing. Yeah. I've heard about this. <laughs> I heard about this from Chamber Queer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we went out for a walk with our dog, unshowered. I didn't even have time to brush my teeth, <laughs> frankly. But we just went out and went, on, um, went, went to Central Park. 
and he wanted to sit on these like rocks somewhere, Sheep's Meadow, I think it was, and he started talking about our relationship. And oh, this could have gone, <laughs> you, you gone in one of two ways. <laughs> <laughs> And I just thought he ate something bad the last night or something. I was like, I don't know what's, what's going on, but okay, now let's go back home so I can practice. And so right as I get up, I don't see him getting up with me. And so I turn around and he gets down on his knees and there was his the ring. Knee. Yes, he was, he got down on his knee. Wow, that is so sweet. <laughs> Well, I wish you both many days of not brushing your teeth <laughs> and walking the dog together. Yeah. So, Stefan and Yuna, could I trouble you for a little bit more music? You mentioned uh, Charles Ives, who was the love child of Robert and Clara Schumann. I'm little known fact. <laughs> Small, little known fact. Um, so, we're going to play one final piece that involves the three of us um, together. Um, and usually when you think of violin, clarinet, and piano, you think of the Bartok contrasts or maybe Stravinsky's Soldier's Tale, but actually Charles Ives wrote a short masterpiece for this unusual formation. Um, Charles Ives, I would say, actually, you know, thinking about the two Schumanns that we just played, I think Charles Ives, while he writes in a very different musical language, is possibly one of the most romantic, with a capital R, um, composers out there. Um, I think he's maybe tied with Brahms as the most nostalgic composer of all time. Um, and his music is all about sort of like wistful memories um, and kind of dreamscapes, I would say, as well. Um, and this piece opens with a kind of hazy ostinato in the piano right at the beginning, which sort of sets the tone for this kind of, kind of mysterious but also tender reverie that the violin embarks on. Um, and when the Clarinet enters for the first time when Yuna plays, you hear a completely different sound world. Naive, um, kind of open-hearted, kind of Copeland-esque also. Um, so Ives had many different musical personalities, but at the core is this sort of uh, tenderness and cling clinging to tender memories of the past. So this is Charles Ives' Largo. Stefan Jakif, Yuna Kim, and Greg Kaler.
Una Kim, Stefan Jacqui, Greg Kaler, thank you so much. Una's going to be at Queens College March 13th. Stefan, you're going to be in Sanibel Island. You choose which show to attend, but thank you all for sharing the music of Charles Ives and the Schumanns. Cheers. Thank you so much. Hey everybody, so if you're enjoying what you've experienced here in the green space, we have a couple other shows for you to uh, come down to. On Friday, we have a Valentine's Day meditation series with a real life couple, Lucille Chong and Alessio Bax. You get a little meditation, you get a little music, you will hear it all in a new way. That's Friday at 1230. We also have Stephen Isserlis, the great cellist, coming in on February 28th. And our Ish International Women's Day concert on Sunday, March 8th at 2 p.m. And all of these things that we do, including this beer jam, is made possible because of listener contributions. So we're going to be coming around collecting money right now. I hope that's okay. And also sending, giving you out beers. Um, so we're going to have a pledge drive coming up, and I do hope you will keep in mind all of these artists and all, the things that you, all these beers that you've been able to enjoy tonight. Um, and one thing I do want to share with you, which I'm, nobody else has seen. This is, this is big. Because I love you all individually and collectively, I'm going to show you the new WQXR tote bag that we'll be unveiling at the next membership drive. Are you ready for that? I'm going to dig deep into the bottom of my heart. And here it is. Yeah, ooh, ah. So here you go, double-sided. And this is the new WQXR tote bag that we'll be talking about during the membership drive. Your contribution gets you this tote bag and supports the radio station. Usually when you think about a membership donation, right, it's exclusive. It's like, lovey, are we updated with our membership? But with public radio, you make this music available to all with that contribution. So I hope that when the membership drive comes around, you will remember this tote bag and this night and make a contribution. So please welcome... The new brewer, same as the old brewers, Jamie Foxx and Michael Foxx, to share a little bit about Greenport Harbor. All right. It's a long time no see. Oh, it's Cheers. Cheers. Well, tell us all about the Black Duck Porter in our hands. So, uh, yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Mike from Greenport Harbor Brewery. We're a small brewery in the North Fork of Long Island. Uh, yeah, North Fork, Long Island love, yeah. <laughs> Um, we are drinking, uh, tonight we have the uh, privilege to share with you our uh, Black Duck Porter. Uh, so uh, the Black Duck Porter, first of all, the name comes from an old uh, rum running vessel that uh, used to, uh, during Prohibition time, ship beer from Rhode Island to the North Fork on Long Island and keep the good people of New York City inebriated and happy. <laughs> Why didn't they call it a beer running boat? God, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Solid question. Um, yeah, no, I don't know. I have an answer for that. So here's to the Black Duck. Here's Carrying to the Black booze Duck. booze to New Yorkers for a long time. That's absolutely. Thank you. Cheers, Cheers. to the Black Duck. Keep me us all inebriated and wonderfully happy. And can you describe a little bit about the flavor characteristics of the Black Duck Porter? Sure, love to. So what we're looking at here is a, a New York Porter, which is a seldom done Porter style. It is uh, based off an English Porter, so it's drier, it's lower in ABV. So we're looking at a dry Porter about 4.8% ABV. So, uh, you know, it's something you could drink more than one of and not go all Jumanji, which is great. Um, <laughs> you're looking for roasted malts uh, and notes of espresso, notes of chocolate in this. But what makes it a New York Porter, what makes it a drier English Porter, is the fact that it washes clean and it drinks very lightly. It's effervescent on the tongue. I think when people hear porters or stouts, they expect something thick, something heavy. We wanted to dissuade that kind of uh, inference where you're looking at. So something easily drinkable, a session porter, if there is such a thing. <laughs> there is now. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Mike and Jamie. I have to ask, how did you meet? Oh, uh, uh, so... Uh, Yes, uh, uh, way back in the day, uh, Jamie was a bartender, 
And I was an aspiring stand-up comedian, as you can see, as I'm not been funny. Uh, I gave that up. No, you're pretty, killing right now. You're pretty killing. quickly. I was like, well, this is, I didn't know I had to be funny for this. Um, and uh, the way I would tell the story, since I'm in front of the microphone, is I was too funny to resist. <laughs> the reality of the story is I saw this beautiful woman, and then I wore her down. <laughs> <laughs> And eventually she decided to go out on a date with me, and then I got my sharp little claws in her. <laughs> oh, easy. Too far. <laughs> Too far. It's okay. Too far. And, and now I get to uh, have the privilege of calling her uh, my beautiful, my lovely wife. Oh, Mike and Jamie Foxx, the most adorable couple in brewing. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Well, I've been wearing this B minor conversation heart all night, and it's finally time for something in the key of B minor, wouldn't you say? So please join um, uh, good friends of the station and the beer jam, Michael Thurber and Tessa Lark. So great. Finally, B minor. Oh my gosh. You know, that was um, an invention by Johann Sebastian Bach. One of the things that classical nerds say a lot about Bach is they'll tell you that he wrote all this music and he also had 20 children. And they tell you, like, they're bragging about it, like, whoa, he's just making it happen. And so people do that. My first reaction is, like, gross. And then my second is that it's not that he wrote all this music and also had children, it's he wrote this music because he had children. Because you know that with eight kids in diapers and the Bakta mom at home, he was calling from the office every night. Like, I would love to do bedtime and dinner with you, but <laughs> this cantata's not gonna write itself, so I'm just gonna stay another hour. Is that okay with you? Because I, I, look, I'll be back in time, we can watch our show. But I just, if I get a little more work done for services tomorrow morning, it's gonna be fine. He wrote like a thousand pieces that way. <laughs> and, and this is a piece, these inventions are part of your most recent record. Can you say a little bit about the Inventions album? Yeah, um, our album luckily doesn't involve 20 children. <laughs> we were just wanted to genuinely make a record, um, <laughs> seriously. But um, Michael and I were inspired to work on the inventions actually because of um, the first beer jam you did. There's uh, surprisingly not that much music written for violin and bass, and so we went to the two-part inventions and really loved how it sounded on violin and bass, and um, arranging them really just means I play the right hand and Michael plays the left hand. 
in. So we paired a few of those inventions on our CD invention. <laughs> so clever. Uh, with some inventions. Stretch, I guess, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But we, yeah, yeah, we had too much beer before we yeah, named it. Um, uh, and then we just we were inspired by his inventions and made some quote inventions of our own and wrote some music together to pair with Bach on the CD. I, I want to hear that in a second, but I also want the, the family here to know your news. Um, this news? Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Just got engaged! He's got one, too! <laughs> so this is brand new um, news, right? This just happened, right? Yeah, it happened um, just two weeks ago, um, I, and he's the one who did it, so maybe uh, you want to tell the story. I don't know. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So we were in LA. Uh, Tessa just got nominated for a Grammy. Uh, yeah. Woo. Best classical soloist. And so we were there and we were staying at a really nice hotel downtown. Uh, and I thought, you know what? I, I'm not going to be outdone by the Grammys. So <laughs> I got to do, do something to, uh, to up the ante this weekend. So the first night we got there, we went on the rooftop. Uh, and I popped the question, and luckily uh, she said yes, and here we are. <laughs> All right, congratulations! So much love in the house tonight, I love it! Well, I, I, one of the things I love about the way you play is that you have the most um, expansive and curious minds, and I love the way you're taking kind of your classical training, but your just omnivorous taste in music and combining it into something that's truly your own. And I'm really looking forward to hearing, tell me about this um, first original you want to share. Uh, yeah, so the first tune that we're going to do is, um, what are we going to do first? Cedar and Sage. Uh, so this was actually one of the first tunes that we wrote together. Um, it was inspired from some travels that we did uh, in the southwest region of the country. Uh, and so we'll play that first, and then we'll go right into um, an original called Tumble Time, uh, named after the setting on the dryer machine. Um, <laughs> And, y and you'll hear why. Uh, and that one is actually sort of the one that got us going on this idea of making our own original inventions next to Box. It's actually based off of Box C major invention. So if you know that one, you might hear some of the thematic material twisted and turned. All right, let's hear it. Michael Thurber, Tessa Lark.
So much talent between these two. Michael Thurber, Tessa Lark, and Mazel Tov on your engagement. Will you please give her a big round of applause for Michael and Tessa and all the musicians and all the brewers. Can you get them back on stage? Can we get everybody out here? Where are we? I don't know if they're coming. If not, this will all be for you. Oh, there they are, Yuna and Dasha and Stefan and Greg. And Chamber Queer, all right, and all of our brewers. Please give a round of applause for all of these talented people. Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you next time here in the green space.